Welcome, everyone. We have got another very special guest today. It is episode 11 of the Coin Rivet Podcast. I got my man Josh Arie in the building in Atlanta, getting ready for the World Series of Poker. He is your reigning WSOP Player of the Year champion, two time bracelet winner in 2021, four time overall, all around great guy. Josh, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We've been talking about doing this for a while. Yes. Yes, we have. I appreciate you making the time. I know we just did the, the GG Super Million stream. That yeah. was a couple hours. So we're fresh, fresh off some content, some poker. We're feeling ready and acclimated for the, the WSOP. I guess let's just start with how are you? Uh, where are you? And what are what are your plans here coming up for, for the World Series? Man, I'm doing great. I uh, I'm once again like I'm in an amazing, like my headspace and mentally, I'm just in the best place I've been in so long. Like I, it's the last year was amazing. Um, And my results like just showed on top of just running hot. Even, even if I hadn't done well, like it would have been one of my best years ever. Uh, My life just like, took a turn for the best and um my relationship with my kids is like it's never been and my relationship with my dad and then i've just i'm blessed to have just the best girlfriend that it's uh it's i don't know i'm just uh, all around just happy guy i mean it's and then you know all that just rubbed off into my professional life and uh had a year for the ages that uh I'll always look back and uh, just be, just bring us brings a smile to my face about you know the stuff I was able to to accomplish professionally last year. Yeah, I mean it's of course we're gonna spend some time we're gonna reminisce about that. I know we got to play a few times last year, and of course winning player of the year a lot has to go right. There's there's a lot of yeah. top players you're competing with, right? There's a lot of guys that are putting a lot of volume that are having. And there's some special multi bracelet winners other players that had a, a ton of great results. So to actually come out as number one uh, is pretty special. So no one can take that away. Um, but I, I do want to kind of talk about this energy and sort of mindset stuff, because you mentioned this in the stream earlier when we were doing the, the commentary for the Super Millions. And, you know, I'm a big believer in that, too, about energy and sort of taking a step back, to taking it in and understanding what's happening. Because I feel like nowadays there's so much distractions, so many things happening you know, also you mentioned you have kids, girlfriend, life, then to like go to a poker table, be clear minded, play your best, be focused. It's not easy to do. And we all have yeah. distractions, whether it's, you know, business, personal, whatever. Right. What, what is, what was a, a big, um, you know, talk to me a little bit about how that works and, and, and just maybe how you're able to, to, to play and be focused when you have all these other things happening. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, you know, I, I brought up earlier when we were talking was like, I'm a, I'm, I can judge myself pretty well. Like I'm, I'm a pretty honest critic with, for myself. And if I don't bring my best to the table, I'm, I understand that. And so I, I understand that my best, I need my best to compete with this day and age of poker. I don't study poker. I don't, um, you know, I, I, and I'm not like, I'm not saying that, oh, I'm better than that. I'm just saying that I just don't, I don't enjoy the grind. I'm kind of lazy. I don't enjoy studying poker, but I think I bring a different aspect to the table. And I know that that has to be spot on. And, um, it's just really important for me to stay focused and clock in and, you know, stay clocked in and stay fully engaged whenever I'm competing. And if I'm not able to stay fully engaged, then it's, it's, it's a waste of time. And uh, so, but like the different things that I like to do to be able to stay engaged is, you know, just make sure that all my aspects of my life are in order and, um, not have, you know, not, uh, stay, I can't think of the right word. Um, in order to stay focused, like I have to make sure that my kids are straight, 
you know, my life is straight. I don't have somebody ringing, texting me and a million things and bitching about shit. You know, I've got Rachel is just my number one fan and, and, and she wants nothing but the best and wants me to succeed. And I'm just able to go and clock in and, you know, do my thing. And, uh, and it worked last year. And, and I, I, I assume that, you know, if I'm able to stay, uh, with that level of focus, I, I expect some success this year as well. Yeah. And, and tell me last year, what worked for you so much in particular? Like, was there a moment where you were like, wow, I'm just like, things are working out. Like I got my lucky seat and dealer or some weird event or just like, you know, you, you had a win early. Was it that, you know, a flip, a pit, was there anything that stands out to you that's kind of put you on the right track? Well, it was, um, the first two weeks was kind of like ho-hum. I think I had two or three caches the first two weeks. And I came back to Atlanta and spent three or four days with uh, Maddie, my youngest daughter. And there was a day that I circled on the calendar. It was a 1500 no limit. And I'm sorry, it was a 1500 PLO. And in the 1500 PLOs, that's where I'm going to have the most success. Uh, it's it's going to be a large field and going to have a, a, a lot of inexperienced PLO players. And I came back and that was the first event. And like I flew in and went straight to that tournament and um, just ran pretty good and started feeling really good. Um, and from there, like I end up winning that tournament and, you know, and then just caught a good head of steam and it's been that way for me my whole life like if shit's going good it goes real good like if shit goes bad it it it, it goes real bad there's no like there's no ups and downs it's either all the way up or way down and um i've just always since i was a kid um you know when i get the ball i run with it um and you know i don't know if that's a good thing or i don't know if that's you know me taking advantage of momentum and then on the downswings i don't know if it's me not performing my best um but i just had fun at the table last year and i just there was one thing that i just kept saying to myself was just stay in your seat just stay in your seat find a way to keep your seat and i was going to play i was going to be playing every day anyway so why not last longer in this tournament um it was like literally the last week of the world series where i took not a bad beat but like there's there, to me there's bad beats and then there's important beats um you know like you get into in, in a month long um, in a month's worth of poker you get into a lot of situations that are very important for that tournament and it was like the last week of the year where I like, holy shit, I just lost my first important pot. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I just ran really well and I took the ball and ran with it last year. And I just, so basically I just told myself, just stay in your seat. I'm going to play anyway. I'm going to um, buy into the next tournament anyway. So why not stay in this one? You know, it's funny you say that about the the 1500 because I actually I hadn't seen you or talked to in a long time, but I remember in the GG Lounge uh, on like a late dinner break. I yeah, think I, I just remember that. that tournament, and then you were like chip leader in that tournament. And then like I saw you the next day or whatever, a day later, day and a half later, and you had won the bracelet. And then uh, we started chatting a bit and, and and ran to each other a few times. But um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's it. It's funny also to say that because. You know, to hear that you took time off, like not many players or probably former WSOP player of the year are like leaving probably for days at a time. Also, that took so long to get started because, you know, if you would have told yourself when you flew back from Atlanta to play that 1500 no limit event that you were going to win player of the year. I mean, you were probably like the odds were just insurmountable, right? Yeah, and it's not even like on the radar. Yeah, I didn't. I never thought about player of the year until um, until after my second bracelet. Uh, when I won the the tournament that we final table together, yeah, um, that's when I started thinking about uh, player of the year. Um, I'm weird in a way where where 
I kind of need a little extra motivation. And in last year and even this year, you know, my extra motivation is, is I really want to get nominated for the Poker Hall of Fame, for the World Series of Poker Hall of Fame. Um, I think that last year's performance you got me on this on the radar to the possibility of being nominated. Um, I think if I were to have a good year this year, it would be it would be sad if I wasn't nominated. I think I think that I've had a pretty good career. There's not many people that there's not many people that have you know put up results for 25 years, and most of my results are at the World Series of Poker. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's my driving motivation this year is to get my name on, uh, the ballot. I, I don't expect to be, um, I don't expect to be nominated. It would, it would, um, there's just much more, many more qualified players than me. And there's, I think only one player a year now. So, um, but just being, being nominated would be something cool to, um, you know, leave to my kids and my grandkids. Um, the, that is, yeah, that is pretty amazing. I'm actually just taking it back. Cause I didn't, I hadn't scrolled down and you're, and I think you actually mentioned this, but it didn't sign with me. Your first ever cash on your hand and mob is a WSOP bracelet. I mean, that's insane. What, what, <laughs> yeah. how's that even possible? What, what does that mean? Yeah, you, you won. I mean, it was, you know, I was crushing the guys uh, at home and I had a friend that was uh, going out to the World Series for uh, a couple years and he and, and I literally would crush limit hold'em games. That's what we played. And he was like, I'll go in halves with you, 1500 a piece. And uh, I, it was my second tournament ever. I I played the the opener was always the big tournament at the World Series, um, and I didn't do any good in that. And uh, I actually tried to play the opener on. I stayed up all night playing video poker the night before. Played the opener. It was like a two thousand dollar event. Got knocked out, and then got like sixteen hours of sleep, and then played that event, and ended up winning it. And wow! But um, yeah, that it's uh, it's been a while. I, it, it's crazy the like on the amount of people I know that have been on their first cash is like a final table or a win. It's it's sort of scary or at least a final table. So that's a, it's another one. Just as the actual win in in at WSOP. So you got you got the taste of it. Did this kind of hook you into tournaments? Like when this oh, happened, yeah. was this? Yeah, this I, was I it? Didn't, there was um. So I I came up playing in Biloxi, Mississippi. Like, uh, I really, I started in Atlanta, but there's no organized poker. It's all underground. And I kind of outgrew the games in Atlanta. And I would just drive down to Biloxi every time I had money and I would always go broke. Um, and then eventually I stopped going broke. And I think there was a Biloxi poker open or something. And I final tabled like three years in a row and um, won it one year. But that was before the tracking. Um, those uh, Hend and Mob didn't track those. Um, so I I was a really confident, cocky young kid that pretty much like I was really good at pool, and so I was really good at baseball, and anything that I put my mind to, I was pretty successful at. Um, so success in poker was um it didn't surprise me i was really cocky and um as i look back i am extremely fortunate that i started playing in the late 90s instead of the mid 2000s when poker got really popular and much smarter people came along um but yeah, I I expected to succeed. Is as stupid as that sounds. It, there was there was a very harsh reality for me as the early two thousands came around, where I struggled because poker was growing, and um, I, once again, like I said before, I didn't study much, um, and so my game didn't evolve, and 
you know, you know, as well as anybody that in poker, you have to continue to evolve. Um, but yeah, it was, it was some, there was some early success that, uh, that, you know, made me addicted to the rush. I'm just, I'm a competitor at heart. I love competing no matter what it is. Like yeah. if me and you were walking down the hall and it's like, I want to walk a step ahead of you. Uh, it's just weird. It's yeah. no matter oh. what, we could find some way to compete. Yeah. Well, we we got a dinner. I got that on the books. Yeah, I did you get you out. Yeah, me. that was you're, that you're was one uh, ahead. One a little ahead. Well, yeah. speaking of one ahead, how about this one ahead on a seven figure score? What was this like in two thousand four? I mean, this is I haven't even clicked on this. This must have been what this was David Williams versus uh, Raymer yeah. heads up. Yeah. So um, two, it was two. it was extremely relieving um i with the little bit of success that i had i was still in and out of money um it was awesome to be able to like tell my dad you know dad i don't need a job you know my dad is uh, i was telling somebody earlier that you know my brother went to college my sister went to college they work regular you know nine to fives and that was never my thing, um, but it was really cool to be able to to let my dad understand that I do have a future in poker. Um, and it was like, yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty freaking cool having, I mean, life changing money. Um, I was twenty nine years old and um, still a little too young to have that much money, but. Um, I made some mistakes along the way, just like everybody, but uh, I learned from them. And I think that it's uh, definitely molded me into a much more rounded person that I am today. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a quite a score. I mean, this was poker just got really big, right? Oh, three, oh, four. This is right at the, the start of it. Um, what, what was that feeling like playing like for millions of dollars, you know, out of because it kind of just came into reality very quickly right there's th third place uh i don't remember how they did the final tables i don't think there was pause maybe it was straight no, through no we but... played straight through i remember like specifically um it was just this huge adrenaline rush um i had we were we were in this little closet and matt savage was uh the tournament director at the time and he's about to announce everybody and all nine of us are in this little closet waiting to be in, announced like it's like the WWF or something. And I'm just bouncing up and down. I have so much adrenaline. And because when you get to that point, I mean, you're at the final table of a 2300 people tournament and you just feel like you're going to win. Like you, you, you feel like it's destiny. And um, I remember Matt just telling me, Josh, you got to calm down. And I just looked at it. And I was like, Matt, it's the fucking final table of the main event. I'm not calming down. He's like, you still got to go play poker. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, it was, it was awesome. My best friend came out there. My dad came out there and, um, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty amazing. That's, that's sick. So, so you do end up, you know, it happens fast because 18 was only 140, seven thousand or so so like you know all of a sudden two tables left down to final table i mean dan harrington obviously a legend david williams gets that score he's been around greg raymer takes it down but uh you know you get that two and a half million it looks like you were were you pretty much on this the, the circuit at that point because you get um, third in the wpt yeah. right after and then you win um the next wsop it looks like you didn't really play tournaments in between or at least many and you you take down the world series event right after yeah as well. i've always um i haven't you know, I've never really been fully on the circuit. I always had kids and, you know, and made it a point where I wanted to be around my kids' lives. But, um, yeah, I was out there grinding pretty hard, um, enjoying playing. And, you know, poker was cool at the time and we were getting a lot of perks and, you know, we'd get picked up in limos and put up in hotel rooms. And, um, you know, I was, I was running around with, uh, me and Eric Lindgren were really, really close at the time. And he had unlimited money at the time. So we were really living the high life, you know, in the 2004, five, six era. 
and there was sponsorships and pokers on TV twice a week. And um, we had a good time. <laughs> yeah, that's that might be for another uh, tale, another podcast, <laughs> for a uh, different kind of podcast, <laughs> different series. Um, uh, I want to ask you just kind of saw this. I haven't seen this term before, too. Just I don't, I, we could spend forever going through your head and mouth, but this one in particular in San Jose, Calvin era wild card. And it's just funny because I click on it and I saw you beat Dave Williams. You were three handed with the, no, the main event. So a little difference in, in money and whatnot, but this was still got to feel sweet. This difference. Yeah, in that was money. That was awesome. That was uh, so Bodog was our um, David and I were both sponsored by Bodog and yeah, Calvin Air. Yeah. Calvin Air put on a uh, a free roll for there was the Bodog pros and then Daniel Negreanu was a guest uh, was a guest and um, I ended up winning it. It was really really cool. It was scary. Like the the Federales in Costa Rica raided. Uh, his house it was it was really interesting but um yeah that was uh that was i met chuck liddell that trip it was pretty cool and like somebody paid chuck liddell like 200 dollars to choke him out and it was it was yeah it was those is were the that, days that, that was that was fun that's where cameo all started huh pay 200 for uh instead of shout outs you could get get, <laughs> get choked, choked out. out yeah that, that's where it, it all was, came yeah it was uh I, I got to do some really cool shit when I was with Bodog. There was, uh, we got to be backstage at like a Snoop concert one time. Um, we we did like this media training at this house in that was on. It was like a ten million dollar house in Malibu on the on the Pacific West Coast Pacific yeah. Coast Highway. Uh, we did some really cool stuff there. I, I'm very grateful for my years at at Bodog. Very cool. Yeah, that's a uh, that that's a that's a name I haven't heard in a while, but yeah. I remember they were doing a lot of stuff. And then again, not going to spend all the time on the results, but here second in a WPT, and this was the one I think you mentioned earlier. It's against your yeah. buddy, right, Daniel Lai, and this was you guys ended up playing a big flip or or something, but another huge score there. Yeah, it was a weird spot because in, uh, Eric Lindgren actually was staking Daniel Lai, and I had actually broken off from Eric, but me and Eric were still really close. And, um, we get head up and I had a slight chip lead and I called Eric. I was like, man, we don't want to play a sit and go for 600,000. Um, let's just make a deal. And he's like, no, nah, we've already, we've both won money. Just play for it. And, uh, I end up losing. I mean, Danny's an amazing player and he pretty much crushed me, but, um, yeah, that's the closest I've, I've been to, I was, I was a flip away from uh, having a WPT title. That's uh, yeah. I mean, look, it's, I guess it's one of those things you put yourself in, put yourself in good positions. And again, you're not, it's not always going to work out, but you have a lot of big scores, big results. And we'll, we'll definitely go through your 2021 uh, player of the year, but I want to ask you a little bit about kind of pivot into uh, the schedule here for this year coming up and have, how much, how much time do you take to look, through this like do you go through and say all right, i'm definitely playing this i might play that i see how i'm feeling or do you kind of just literally go day by day um i i make it a point to play all the plos because I, i'm pretty good at it and i enjoy it um the rest of the stuff is by feel and then the higher limit stuff near the end is just if i'm in the player of the year race um but you know, I'll I'll play a heavy load at the beginning, and I know that I'm not a I don't have an edge in over the field in some of these events. But I'm a competitor. I love I love you know the rush when you get deep into a tournament. It's 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 intoxicating and it's very addicting. Um, but you know, if if I'm not doing well, you know, come June 20th or something like that, then I'll just enjoy my time in Vegas. There's no better place in the world to, to hang out and eat good dinners and go to shows and play golf. And all my friends will be there. So, right. um, I, I'll just, I'll take a couple weeks off and just play the main event. You know, it's, right. I, I really enjoy pot limit Omaha and I really enjoy the main event. Um, if I'm to do good in the, in the player of the year race, I have to, put up really good results in pot limit Omaha. Otherwise I have no chance. 
Um, so we'll just see, you know, if you can look at, uh, you'll, I'll be able to know if I'm in the player of the year race, just from my pot limit Omaha results. Very, very cool. And if, if there's one event you just won't miss, what is, is it, you know, the main event? Okay. But other than that, like PLO wise, 10 K 25 K high low, the 10 K PLO, 10 K PLO, you know, the, the, as I've gotten older and I noticed this the last couple of years that around the bubble time of these high limit tournaments is not fun. It's very, very stressful. And it's not just the players that are stressed. It's the dealers that are stressed because there's so much expected from the dealers to be perfect. And there's so much there's you're when you're when you're dealing with the with the high end uh, limit tournaments you're dealing with notable pros and notable pros just know everything so when there's a ruling to be made uh, a lot of people just don't allow a a floor per and 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 myself included like um if there's a a, a ruling that takes place around the bubble that falls in the gray area, like people aren't usually um, won't accept the ruling from certain people. And they're forced. I want to speak to so-and-so I want your boss. And there's just, there's a lot of stress when there's a lot of money uh, on the line. And I've grown to where I don't enjoy that part of it. Um, I don't enjoy putting, the dealers in those situations because, you know, they're just trying to work and, you know, we choose to do this and we understand and accept the fact that that part of the tournament comes up. And when there's a dealer that's just pushing through and they just happen to be in, you know, right around the bubble time when the stress is, it it makes it rough. And I, I feel for those people and, um, it's just nature of the beast. And that's why I enjoy the five and the 10 Ks. It's just, it's so much more fun. Right. Yeah. It's still, still enough. The purses get big, yeah. but it's not like, it's a little less. Uh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying where it can be, be fun, but you can still win money, but not right. so intense. Um, I, I gotta, I gotta ask you uh, about as well about crypto and BTC. Cause we like to on, this each time want to do sort of a price prediction. Obviously, BTC's had a bit of a rocky ride the last month or so, but it kind of rebounding slightly. Do you have, let's just start with this. Give me a price prediction for Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, January 1, 2023. So the end of this year. Mm, I'm an optimist. Like I, I think that around the end of the year, it, should be around mid 40s for bitcoin and uh ethereum probably rebound to like low 3000s um but i was reading this really i don't remember who it was but the guy just seemed really smart i guess everybody that writes around about bitcoin just sounds smart to me but this guy like had a really um intriguing argument like very convincing that Bitcoin will be at like 200,000 by the end of 2024. So I hope he's right. You know, that would, poker will be really good if, if Bitcoin, you know, yeah, gets that high. For but, sure. So, so you are a, you are a believer. You, be, you like the concept and, and, and obviously with poker, we have exposure to it. It's just kind yeah. of in our face a lot. You, um, you're, you're I'm like, a believer in one of I know this is the long version of the answer, but like one of the things that I've tried to do in my life is surround myself with smart people, uh, believe in smart people's decisions and, and just go with it. So I, it's like, I don't try to make big decisions, um, on certain things. I try to handicap smart people and see what they're doing. And there's so many smart people involved in crypto. I just have to be there and, and yeah, I'm a believer and I try to follow smart people and I've, I've followed them off the cliff on many things. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I truly think that crypto is going to be fine when it's all said and done. 
for sure and and any in terms of nfts kind of been a big cool off and a lot of a lot of this word is sort of just tossed around right it's like everyone talks everyone's an expert but no one has any idea do you believe in any of the, the mint ones like uh crypto punks or the the apes do you, do you do you like them do you think they're cool or just not um, your thing i i i have mixed feelings um i think it's a cool idea i think that um, NFTs that have utility are are extremely cool, um, but there is just a million different projects out there with no utility. That's just, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say a scam, but it's just like you're collecting baseball cards or something. Or right, but yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> there's really cool projects out there, like like V friends out, you know, if you own a V friend, you can literally go to any, um, any conference that Gary V has. Um, there's, there's one project that I'm in called gutter cats and the gutter cats, they, they do cool shit all the time where they have meetups and they, they've created a really good community around it. And, and I think that if, if, um, if the development team, builds a big community and can make that, that JPEG picture turn into um, an asset in a way where it's like, it's worth more than money to somebody, you know, where, where it, it, by having it, it allows me to do this. And yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it's definitely something that's here to stay. I mean, it's, yeah. I agree with you. I mean, it's similar to crypto, like there's Bitcoin, Ethereum, right? Similar to like a crypto punks, or you mentioned gutter cats might be like an altcoin. There's some that have that, that are doing the right things that have a community that are real, but similar to also baseball cards. There's like, you know, there's going to be some very valuable rookie cards and special ones, but the majority will just not really have any right. utility, like value. So, you know, it, listen, part of it is if you enjoy it, similar to art, if you like something, I always tell people right. that too. It's like, look, if you like it, if you think it's, you know, something that means something to you or you, you find beauty in it, it's one thing, but you got to understand there's a lot of risk and, and a lot of stuff will just end up not being uh, super valuable. So I yeah, think and also, and also, sorry to interrupt you, but like, is the, the, the more and more that we evolve to an online life, talking about like the metaverse and, you know, everybody working from home and, you know, being so, um, so dependent on our computers and the internet, anything internet based is going to have value. So it's just, you know, there's going to be some, some great dev teams that come about with, with NFTs that we might have to have at some point, like you might to, to, buy a certain pair of shoes, you might have to own an NFT, like a membership card. Yep. Yeah. I, I, again, I think you're right. I think we're just heading that way. Technology, yeah. at the end of the day, people aren't just going to, you're just not going to have as many goods and, and trading cards and other things. That's going to be what, what people, uh, what, what people are looking for. Um, all right. Well, let's, again, rabbit hole. It's fun. We cover it. We got your predictions. We'll put that on the screen. We'll have that locked in. Let's see how you fare at the end of the year with that. I hope you, I hope that guy's right. The 200 to 2024 though, that guy, I want uh, that guy on the podcast. That's yeah. That guy sounds like a optimist and, and I like it. Um, let's shoot over here to Twitter. And I, I see, you know, you were the, the WSOP player of the year. I noticed here pinned about action. And I do have to ask you about this because I know there's several options uh, on, on, for people to stake and do things and buy action. And, but maybe tell me a little bit about pocket fives and what your involvement is with yeah, that and so, how that works. So back in August, um, you know, I went and have lunch with a friend and he told me about this project that, that they were starting. And I thought that it was perfect for me um, getting, cause I've always bought and sold, um, bought pieces of people in tournaments and sold action, my own action in tournaments. And what we do at pocket fives is we started a staking platform and it's very different than other ones out there because we don't charge any rake. Um, we actually operate at a loss, but we have a bigger picture in mind. Um, we want to we want Pocket Fives to be this hub of poker in the future, where when you think about finding out anything about any tournament poker lifestyle, anything, we want Pocket Fives to be this grand central station of poker. So right now, what we're focusing on is um, 
you know, having big name players list action and like you can buy pieces of Daniel Negreanu at, at no markup. You can buy pieces of Sean Deeb at no markup. And um, there's, there's no cost for depositing. There's, there's, we we literally lose on every transaction, but we have um, a bigger picture in mind, and we want poker to grow, and we want we want to help poker grow, and and make sure that not only like the stars of the game don't need um, don't need pocket fives to be able to enter these tournaments, but we do need the stars to come onto the site to bring to 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 shine light on what we're doing. Um, to eventually we'll be able to have anybody post a tournament on there. And that's what it's going to take to uh, allow poker to keep growing the way that it has. Yeah. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings on this topic. And obviously I, we've shared some discussions and you know, again, there are, there's several options. I think it's great. I, I do agree. Like ultimately, you know, the, the easier it is for people to be able to buy a piece and stake in this country jurisdictions and things are done where it's like tied in, you buy a piece, it's automatically handled. I mean, these type of things, it's great for poker, right? It's going to help field sizes, people that are kind of like, because the thing is, it doesn't have to be all well-known top level pros or, or well-known because like ultimately, you know, if it's like, here's the thing, you got Billy Bob from your home game that wants to maybe go play. Like I, I take a peek, but you don't want to deal with it. You don't want to be texting, sending right. Venmos to all this stuff. Like the, once it gets to a point where there is staking, where it's easily done, where people can just follow along uh, and, and be, be a part of it. And then the transactions are all taken care of. Like the easier all this stuff gets done, it's just going to help a lot. Cause like the, you, you might buy a piece of Billy Bob, but you don't want to text right. them. You don't want to collect from them. You don't yeah. want to have to deal with that. You just want to be able to say, look, man, go to, go to Vegas, knock yourself out. I remember my first time to Vegas. You want to play a 2k buy in tournament. You want me to buy $200 worth? Go for it. Like, sure. Are you a favorite? Maybe not, but like, you know, you got to have, you got to have this where it's easy and, and seamless. I think this is also a function of technology where these yeah. type of things are becoming easier. It's becoming also updates. I don't know if you, you may not have gotten an, catch this but the triton poker uh series which i think you said you saw an event the app is the sickest app i've ever seen in my life like you go there you can click it, it gives you hand histories oh wow. so say so like not only hand histories they had a person at every table doing the updates so i mean grant there was only like four to ten tables but still imagine that if you wanted to sweat your buddy in a 25k plo yeah. and he's at table four you get to see his chip graph like it's online right. in every hand history from the whole yeah, tournament. Yeah, that's the- um, that's one of the things that I've really focused on over the past eight or nine months that I've been at Pocket Fives is how to um, how to make the buyer's experience better. And it's it's poker players are lazy in nature. So right now, the only way to really make the people's experience better is updating on Twitter. But if 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 I can find a way to make sweating the poker tournaments a more enjoyable experience, I could see I, I'm reaching t- for the stars and I want to say like betting NFL football, but it, it's never going to be betting NFL football. But it can be up there. Like it can be up there with pro sports because there's nothing more fun than sweating a deep sweating your buddy in a deep run. And if you're able, if I'm able to figure out a way to get people uh, updates every two minutes, every five minutes, something like that, it's gonna the 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 staking market is gonna explode and I, I got an idea. Is gonna, Go ahead. Tell tell me what you think about this. So, what about at like now Bally's? It's it's a new new WSOP venue. Maybe not this year. It's too late now. But what if you were able? Because they have these these you know. I remember in the Rio too. There's these cages like across the top where they they hang lights. They have cameras. Whatever. What if you could just not have whole cards on every table? But what if you could actually like sweat like have nest or zoo or cameras where you could like your your buddy goes plays and you could at least see if they're in or not or your buddy yeah you, you, no, it tells I've, you what table you're at. You know, or or like you have a card that like it sits down, it automatically shows what table you're at. So like now on a leaderboard, it's like, yo, this guy's at table 12, seat nine. 
And like yeah. all of a sudden, like you can at least see if they're there. Maybe you can see the all in action if it's turned over. You don't have to. That's be able a to great see the whole idea. Cards. That's a yeah. like if if we. And that's could not get, that expensive. No, not you that... could buy these little cameras and Nest, like yeah, and have a you know I could even have um, a representative there from Pocket Fives and go hand it to this player and say, hey man, put this up by your table so people can sweat you. Yeah. And it's the person that. And, and I said this from the very beginning. There's a few reasons why people stake. You stake for positive EV. You stake because you're a junkie and want action. Um, so how do you in uh, how do you the I'm sorry, the player that makes the experience better for the buyer is going to be the most successful. It's not going to be the best player that puts the best rate out there. People want to sweat. People want action. So if some guy comes along and proves that he's making your experience more fun, he's going to sell endless amount of staking and he's going to be able to play any tournament. Yeah. And like I tried to do that last year during the World Series. Um, I, I tried to do a bunch of updates. My friends were making fun of me. But I wanted to show I want to show people the following that you can build up just by engaging with your with your buyers. And um, it's going to be cool, like the way that this evolves, like I have brilliant people behind me Um, right now. We're trying to get uh, integration with the cage. We've been able to do it one time. And when I get integration with the cage, that totally takes all. liability out of the way i don't have to worry about dealing with only people that i know i can i can basically open up staking for every living human because the cage will hold what they owe pocket fives and when that happens and a um more frequent figure out a way to update the buyer more frequently then it's going to blow up yeah no i think there's there's a lot of room there i mean look look people want to there's a lot of it's it's pretty obvious why that's so good because it brings money into poker. People that aren't even playing or areas that they're not like now you have more people able to play more and it's just more fun. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But for sure, again, there's multiple options for sites to do it. And it's great to see that it's becoming innovative and it's becoming a thing and it's it's all going uh, it seems like things are moving very quickly. And I think, again, I think it's just a factor of technology catching up and sort of at right place, right time where everything kind of unlocks and it just sort of works where everyone's you know happy and new new services come together and and provide people the best sweating experience. Because like you said, yeah, like it, NFL it, red zone, you want like the red zone for poker. Yeah, like, I mean, right. you know, uh, there, there's a lot there's of people all in that, over here, yeah. run around, run over there and walk to the table. But it's basically yeah. like. You know, there's uh, our main competition is State Kings and you're involved with them and their software is really good. But it's basically boiled down to like the two biggest names in poker. Who are they? They're Daniel and Phil. I have Daniel. You guys have Phil. So it's like Phil's fan base hangs out over at State Kings and (laughs) and Daniel's fan base hangs out over at at Pocket Fives. And I, I, I hope that. Um, the staking world grows to where we can all flourish and we can all succeed. Um, And we, we will need some help uh, along the way from, um, you know, the casinos allowing us to send them some sort of email saying we own a piece of uh, player X. And um, if that's ever able to happen, then uh, we will all, uh, it, it, it will be uh, two great, two great companies that'll be here forever. Yeah, no, again, I think it's similar to poker sites as well. Like it's great. You know, it's, if one site is like, there's only one show in town, it's sort of usually not the best thing for everyone. Yeah. You don't, you don't want anybody to have a monopoly on any, no matter what it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot of ways I think the collaborator to, to work and and make things work. Cause I think again, a few key factors, it's just like going to open, it's just going to be so nice for everyone, both sides, right. people that get, they want to play and people that want to buy action. So I think there's uh, you know, I think it's an exciting time and things seem to be moving pretty quickly. So, all right. Very, very cool. And how, how much time do you spend on that? Like working on that versus other stuff? It's, like is- it's, I mean, it, it takes most of my time. I mean, yes. I mean, now with the world series here, it's crazy. Like 
my phone rings off the hook. Um, I get texts at, you know, the hours that poker players keep. I mean, I'm getting texts at three and four in the morning. I'm getting texts right now. Um, it slows down. Uh, but right now I, I like being busy. I like being able to focus on something. Um, there's no worse feeling, you know, playing poker. We have a lot of downtime. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's been a joy to focus some energy on a project that I, that I really care a lot about. I got to ask you how, so we talked about focus and clear headspace. How are you able to, especially with this sort of being new and you being at the fra- the face of this last at the WSOP, did, did you not find that distracting? Like probably, or, or did you, were you able to disconnect and sort of offset some of the responsibility and some of the um, stuff to people and just, how were you able to do both? I, I don't know. There was, I mean, there was times that I turned my phone off. Um, there were times, you know, I, just multitask and I don't know. I, it was, it was, I expect this year to be much more hectic and there's going to be times where I definitely have to put the phone on silent, but um, I don't know. I just, I, I care about it so much that like I, if there was something that I had to do for it, I cared about getting that done just as much as you know the task at hand playing poker so it's not like when i was um when somebody would text me with a package or a question or something i it didn't bother me like it wasn't it wasn't it just i don't know i just i loved doing it and right i loved the project and so yeah so it didn't bother me very cool and uh what what would you say? I'm just gonna like let's just real quick go through just run down. So so this last WSOP 2021, you get a when when did it when did it actually break through? You said that this was right here. Like you really had yeah. nothing. You went home for a little bit. So yeah, this I is went like home, October 20th. Yeah, I went home like on the 15th and was home. Or no, I went home right after October 13th. Um, and I was home for like three days and flew back out and uh played that tournament and then i basically like was just on literal fire from from that point on and and i've told this story before this is pretty cool so the tournament uh the the plo8 that i won i got knocked out sixth of the poker player championship and snap regged the plo um i snap regged the plo8 when I got knocked out sixth, usually the final table is six players, but they made the final table five players. So they stopped for the night. Um, when we played our final table, the PPC was behind us in the Thunderdome. Yeah, I remember and, that. And yeah. um, I actually won the tournament, and they were still five-handed. So we won a whole tournament. I was the last person to be knocked out of the tournament that was going on the PPC. And since then I won that tournament before they knocked another person out. And, you know, that was, uh, that there was like a, a really, uh, a turning point when we, when we opened our chips up for day three, they had just started back, um, behind us. And I was like, well, is it going to tilt me or is it going to motivate me? And, it motivated me to, uh, you know, I, I, I really wanted to win once I got to that point. Not that, yeah. I mean, not that everybody didn't want to win, but like it was, it was huge motivation for me. I always, I'm, I'm dumb. Like I need the money. I, I love winning money. Um, but there's always like, I always need some little extra bit of motivation. It's stupid. Yeah. That's no, I mean, I get it. It's uh, it makes sense. And and how about that hand? Is this maybe the most epic hand in poker? That the one that that <laughs> Those three-handed. Were, yeah, that's uh, that, that's that unfortunate fold. for Ryan that that's how he'll be remembered. It's it's you know, I mean, people don't play limit poker anymore unless you're a super sky high nosebleed limit. So nobody plays limit poker. So, I mean, Ryan, hats off to him. You know, he's played probably very little limit hold him in his life. And he's, he's three handed in the hardest tournament of the year. And, um, you know, he made a mistake and you know, it's, it happens. 
but yeah, the I feel bad for Paul Volpe in that spot because you know he should have been head up with Ryan. You right. know, that's the it, it affected Volpe the most. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of money um difference. But yeah. well, I, I think uh you know, and give me let's uh kind of as we're winding down here, I want to know sort of what your advice would be to someone coming to the World Series for the first time and you've been doing it for so long, you've had success, you kind of know what works, what doesn't. What would be this is also a new venue. So I mean it's kind of yeah. new for you too. So what are some like things that you're looking to look to do or would um, recommend to people? When they get you know, there. mainly enjoy yourself. If it's your first time, don't expect too much. Have fun. Um, take it all in. And by all means, don't gamble outside. You know, don't fall for all the lights and, you know, play higher than you can afford. Um, it's I've always found that I have a comfort zone and I perform – my best inside that comfort zone and the minute i play higher no matter how good or bad the game is my level of play goes down so just i mean number one thing is you know keep playing within your means um i know it sounds boring everybody wants to go to the world series and take a shot and uh but it happens every year and if it's your first time you'll have plenty more chances and, you know, if you get winner and you're winner, you know, I there's nothing wrong with taking a small shot here and there. But, um, you know, there's nothing worse than playing out of your comfort zone and losing. You know, it's it's a really bad mix. And obviously the the easy thing, stay out of the fucking pits and stay out of the strip club and don't take a taxi cab driver's advice on some place that he knows that he can drop you off at, I mean, there's, there's yeah. a lot of vices in Vegas and, uh, I've always had, I, I've always had, you know, as long as you don't go get like too drunk, you're never going to make that many bad decisions. But right. you know, when you start getting hammered and there's a lot of bad stuff in Vegas and a lot of hustlers and all different aspects, probably, you know, the best hustlers in the world, no matter where you go, whether it's, the strip club or it's uh the the pool room or the poker room you know it's it's the elite of the elite you know it's where all the money is makes that's very good advice i i i definitely would say i agree with you what about staying on property do you like to get a house or be off or do you stay in a set, a set hotel do you have a set um, routine i've always liked um staying on the strip um i've been fortunate enough to to make some good relationships at the aria over the years and i like to stay at the aria just because there's weird times that like you'll get knocked out of a tournament and you'll have two hours well like i want to hang out with my girlfriend for two hours and it's a pain in the ass to you know she's all the way over at a house or whatever um then or like dinner breaks. Like I, I just like, I, I like the strip I and mean, a lot of people do houses and I understand that, you know, they like a house better, but um, I like being in the action. You know, I like waking up at three o'clock in the morning and if I can't go to sleep, I'll go downstairs and play video poker and, or I'll, you know, check out the poker room. Um, yep. You know, I, I live in, a, I live in the suburbs in Atlanta, Georgia with no gambling within 500 miles. So, um, it's, you know, for six weeks a year, I'd like to be in the middle of it. You want to be quick access. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, makes a lot of sense. All right. Give me your top places that you've traveled in your life. Give me a couple for poker. Otherwise, what are a few stops you just like you, you've, you've loved being in the world. Um, for travel or poker travel, e both either. Give me one um, or two of you. Each. Know, Jerusalem, like Israel was, I've been to Israel a couple of times in the last 10 years and it is unbelievable. Like it's a place that you just have yeah. to go to no matter, no matter your religion, your religious backgrounds. It's just really freaking cool. Um, uh, what's the, what's the place uh, that you fly into Nice, France, the little country, Monaco, Monaco, yeah. uh, Monte Carlo. Um, that place is cool. One time, uh, it's, I, 
uh, the second time there's literally nothing to see. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, I'll never go back to Paris and play. Uh, I was in the aviation club when it got robbed, and I just still have PTSD oh, wow. to this day. Oh shit! Um, yeah, that was scary shit. Um, really? How, what? How, what exactly? Like you were literally in there, and they it was, were like, oh. "Yeah, it was." So the aviation club is on the second floor of that main road that goes through there. It's the Champ de Lise, I think it's called. Champ de Lise, yeah. Um, and it's the last day of the WPT there. And me and Eric Lindgren were there. Um, I'm playing three and 600 with like David Benjamin and a few uh, maybe local people. But Eric Yellow? is playing. Uh, no, this is uh, three and 600 mixed games. This is back in like 2000. This is 2005. Um, and uh, Eric is playing eight and 1600 at the table next to me. And it's eight in the morning. Daniel, uh, uh, Eric's playing with uh, Barry Greenstein, Phil Ivy, and a couple other people. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and it's eight in the morning, and I have forty thousand in euro in my hand, and I'm standing behind Eric because we have to leave. We have a flight at eleven, so I'm like, Eric, we got to go, we got to go. He's like, one more hand, I'm gonna play till my blind, and I'm standing behind him, and I hear these dishes break around the corner. And I turn and I look around the corner around the wall and I see a guy in a motorcycle helmet and a gun. Like, uh, I think it was a machine gun or like a, a, a assault Uzi. rifle. I yeah. don't remember exactly, um, but it was pointed to the lady's head that cleans the dishes, that picks up all the, all the, you know, the porter. Um, and he's yelling shit in French and I have no idea what he's saying. Um, so I like, so now we're on the second story of, uh, the, the, this poker room is on the second story. So I'm like looking at a window. Do I jump out the window? What do I do? This guy's yelling shit in French. I don't know what he's saying. I'm I wearing 40 like, grand in my hand. I have 40,000 in my hand. I'm wearing like a Atlanta Falcons Jersey. And I look like the most American guy. He's going to kill the Americans first. For and sure. So all this shit's going through my head. So I find this big stack of chairs that is, uh, you know, waited to be carted off because they were kind of breaking the room down. And I look over and Ivy is under the table and he says, so they were playing props in, in the game. And Ivy says, I'm on for doubles next hand. And I'm Stop. like, what the fuck? I'm no over way. here worried about my life, about to pee my pants, and Ivy's on for fucking doubles next hand. Wow. And that's like so eventually, so now the guy makes his way to the cage and he fills a garbage bag full of money up for a full two minutes. And in France, they have 500 euro bills. Yeah. So I, there's no telling how much money. So now, looking to the right i can kind of see the guy at the cage but i see you remember carlos mortensen carlos yeah. mortensen is behind a wall that's next to the cage and this motherfucker is peeking his head around the corner looking at the robber and he's literally like three feet from him he's like peeking his head around the corner to look and see what's going on and i'm just like man i'm in the wrong profession i mean phil ivy I'm about to shit my pants. Phil Ivey's cutting jokes and Carlos Mortensen's trying to get a better view of what's going on. Wow. So eventually. Well, and so what happened? How did they get Eventually they, they, they left. So after about filling this bag for like two minutes, he leaves and there's like a minute of silence and he comes back and I'm like, Oh my God, this is a hostage situation. Um, but he end like he dropped his keys or something and he left again and they he was gone so it was all over and everybody's you know starting to talk and um come so now we're almost late for our flight and they won't let us leave they want the police to question everybody and back then in france they had the smallest phones like it was in the 2005 era where you couldn't like Nokia was trying to make phones smaller than anything. And the bouncer that supposedly had a gun to his head the entire time 
So there was two people, one with a gun to the head to the bouncer and then one that robbed the place. And he asked me what hotel I was staying at because he was going to call my wife at the time and let them know what happened and that we're going to be late. And he dialed the phone number to the hotel perfectly fine. This guy was enormous with the biggest hands. And you would think that a guy that just had a gun to his head for like five minutes would have some adrenaline and his hands would be shaking. And it, he just, it was just like, I, this guy was in on it, I think. And um, they never caught him. Later, later on, they came out with a press release that they got 76,000 euro, which is the biggest fucking lie ever. They guarantee they got every bit of a million dollars, but uh, they just didn't want. I don't remember the guy's name that owned uh, the guy Radiation with the crazy club. hair. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and but that's like I I didn't I didn't lose any money. I had forty thousand euro in my hand the whole time. So and, no one ever came, they didn't come up to you, or no one ever really spoke to you. Those guys? No, no. They just they they had a gun to the porter lady's head the whole time. And they went to the Why? cage. As like a, as a hostage? Yeah. Like oh. if you don't, yeah, either give me money or I'm going to kill the lady, I guess. It was all in French. And wow. and later on, I think that uh, that I was told that they were just saying, get down or nothing's going to happen. Um, but I mean, you don't know that. You don't know that when it's happening. I, I was just, that's, I, that's, that's, I have like three crazy Phil Ivy stories all from like eyewitness accounts that like one there was uh he was flying pri they were flying to uh new york to monaco and the plane had like a real problem like dropped like crazy the masks came down imagine being over the ocean in a little private plane and the masks come down like i i mean that's it i would have i would have been out i'd have been like that's it. you just it's over so antonio has a picture of this of the moment like because he thought they were gonna die you know he had like his little cam like real camera this was probably like 2009 or 10 he had like an actual camera and he he took a photo and it's just like ivy's face just like like calm as a as like whatever but it's like the gas masks are down they really thought they were dying for sure like the the Ugh. woman freaked out but like ivy was just cool as a cucumber didn't even fucking blink and it just whatever but i mean he really is something else so how'd He's they get out of that they they de diverted to iceland and there was some big problem and you know i don't really know other than my Antonio Holy said shit. he was he was sure they were gonna die. It was like Dan Shack and uh, Antonio Phil and um now Antonio's wife. But yeah, so anyway, he's he's cold blooded, man. He's really is. Yeah, he's, he's a he's, he's a, a different guy. breed. He's definitely he's, a different breed. He's he's very sick. But um, all right. Well, Josh, listen, that is uh you've covered a lot. You've given us some good tips to the world series. We want to wish you the best of luck. I, I gotta say, man, I hope. Did I get to get out there? I'm pretty sure I'm going to come for a few days, so we'll have to we'll have to have that absolutely. Dinner. Yeah, dinner's and, on uh, me, buddy. Some high stakes PLO, but I appreciate the time. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in Vegas. And cheers for being on, man. I appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. All right, guys. That's Josh Arie, your 2021 WSOP Player of the Year. Vegas starts tomorrow, and this is Coin Rivet episode number 11 in the books. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next week.